situation now. Health effects, I'm sure all of you in this room will know that there is no safe level of exposure to PM2.5. They've certainly found health effects down to about six micrograms per cubic meter. These are some of the emerging problems. Particles, of course, and new health effects being identified all the time. Nitrogen dioxide, traffic-related air pollution. Ozone, I have to say I'm very concerned about nanoparticles. I asked a scientist, a professor, how he thought those health effects appeared, and he said they would probably appear as sort of degenerative diseases in many years to come. Another cartoon, World Health Organization, our friend Boris, he really does lend himself to cartoons. We produced a calendar. On a very serious note though, in contrast, three British soldiers died tragically during SAS selection, in fact one after SAS selection a couple of years ago. And this really just shows the particle levels and the ozone levels on the day they were doing this selection exercise. I've tried to get the authorities, the coroner, health and safety executive, the police, others to pay attention to this and it certainly should be investigated whether air pollution like this caused or contributed to those three tragic deaths. No one outside the air pollution community has actually expressed any interest in this whatsoever and I find that um, really quite shocking. In Europe, governance is behind a lot of progress in air pollution laws or in complying with air pollution standards and protecting public health. In Europe, we've got rules at three levels. We've got European rules which apply across the whole continent. We've got action in national courts and we have the planning system as well. Clean and London is getting an opinion from a leading QC about the enforcement of, of those laws in the planning system. That will have a large impact. I mentioned before that we're working on this um, new National Emission Ceiling Directive, but if you are interested in getting into the sort of legal side of things, I really would encourage you to see what Client Earth has done. I think they've been involved in some of the CO2 work in Australia, but they rather brilliantly lost in the High Court, lost in the Court of Appeal, and then won spectacularly in the Supreme Court, which meant that the government couldn't do anything about it. So uh, there really is a lesson there if you're trying to uh, enforce these laws. Sources of air pollution. The main point I'd highlight here is that it's very easy to think everything sort of comes within cities, but for particles in London, about three quarters of the particles, PM2.5 within London, actually come from outside. There's been some new scientific work saying a very high proportion of the PM2.5 background emissions come from agriculture. We have got a terrible problem with methane and ammonia and other precursors. Whereas nitrogen dioxide, of course, is a very local pollutant. It gets sort of blown away quite quickly. In Europe, let me put it this way, you know, China, India, Eastern Europe have a terrible particle problem, but in Western Europe we've got a catastrophic diesel problem, and the best measure of that is that King's College scientist, Dr. David Carslaw, said that many roads in central London will tend to have the highest concentrations of nitrogen dioxide in the world, the highest levels in the world, and that's because of 8,500 diesel buses, 22,000 diesel taxis, um, and a whole lot, of course, of diesel trucks and, and cars. About one in two new cars in the UK has been a diesel car, whereas, of course, those market shares are much lower in Australia. In case you're relying on Euro standards to solve this problem, I know you've used Euro standards a lot, but Euro 6 um, is most definitely failing for diesel. There's been some real-world testing and, and real-world emissions much higher of NOx um, than we would expect from the European standard. Also, very significantly, what the manufacturers have done, because there isn't actually a sort of a regulation on NO2 other than it's got to be less than the NOx total, obviously, NO2 as a percentage of NOx has gone from about 10% 10 years ago, 15 years ago. It's up to 75%, certainly over 70%, 70% in motorway driving of one of the vehicles tested recently. Just by thinking that NOx is going down, which actually it isn't because real world's much higher than the emission standards, the NO2 fraction within those NOx emissions is absolutely rocketing.
The government's favourite explanation for air pollution episodes in London is actually Sahara dust. That's very popular. You find ministers trot that out all the time. Even when we did have a, a bit of Sahara dust um, in spring last year, it was really only about 10% um, of the episode. Solutions, just some general principles here. We do need to build public understanding, and to me that is about warning people and giving people advice about protecting themselves and reducing pollution for themselves and others. And of course that aligns very nicely with the mitigation and adaptation that we need to do in respect of climate work. Very much one atmosphere. Of course we need political leadership and I think uh, one of the things I've said to UNEP is a, some sort of hierarchy of um, solutions. When the European Commission looked at its clean air policy package, when they looked at that clean air policy package, of course they did what people normally do which is focus on a percentage of the maximum technically feasible reduction. They don't take into account what can be done through lifestyle changes or just banning or shutting the most inexcusable activities. And I think that's a big lesson here. We need to think of policy in a much wiser way. Of course, most lifestyle changes actually save money, not costing it. We do need to throw everything at it, including the kitchen sink, but you'll know that from working in the field. This is just a sort of silly picture. That was in the mayor's impact assessment. It just shows what he thought could be achieved if he banned tailpipe emissions in central London, sort of nice and blue. Of course, that's not what he's proposing.